Good day everyone, Doc Mika here, and for this lecture, we will be discussing viral infection and spread. What happens after viral replication? Where do the new progeny or progeny virus actually go to make sure that there is this progression of infection to the entire body? All right, so let's begin. For viruses to cause disease, they must first infect their host, spread within the host, and damage their target tissues. So to ensure uh, that propagation, the viruses must then be transmitted to other susceptible individuals, and which means it must be shed within secretions or excretions into the environment. They can be taken up by another host or a vector, or they can be passed congenitally from um, mother to offspring. Right? But one thing that we have to be very clear uh, right now is that viral infection does not uh, equate into clinical disease. All right? It needs to reach a certain point wherein um, the number of the viruses inside a body overwhelm the immune responses of uh, mounted by the host and that it needs to tick a few boxes of um, effects on the cell for it to cause disease. All right. So the outcome of the virus host encounter right, is decided by the virulence of the virus and how susceptible the host is. Right. So I hope you still remember your uh, immunology when we talk about the difference between pathogenicity versus virulence. Can you still remember the difference between these two terms? I hope so, but this is just a... I'll, I'll give a very uh, generic difference between the two, right? Let's start with pathogenicity. Pathogenicity is basically the ability to cause disease, all right? That is different from virulence, which is the degree of pathogenicity, all right? This is the quantitative or relative measure of the pathogenicity or the ability of the virus to cause disease, all right? And each virus that we will be talking about in the next uh, weeks would have a different pathogenicity and would have different factors um, which decides or which dictates how pathogenic it is to its um, specific uh, host or target uh, species. All right. So how do viral infection happen? All right. how, how, sorry, how does viral infection happen? All right, what are the steps in it? These are also outlined on the table on the left. So we will be discussing this in detail. We will start with, of course, uh, host entry, how the variant uh, enters the host, and also how the virus evades the host's natural protective mechanisms, which could be from a um, innate, or sorry, uh, from a cellular level to a humoral level. Again, immuno knowledge is very much appreciated for this course. Um, and also how the virus enters the host cell and hijacks its own cellular machinery for uh, it to produce and replicate within that cell. After that, how do the viruses, the progeny virus or the new viruses, spread throughout the body right does it spread just locally or it causes a systemic spread wherein it is um finding other target organs which are of course defined by the virus's uh, cell and tissue tropism right after that after it has spread throughout the body after it has continued replication and now we have a big um, boatload of new variants, how do these variants look for another host? Okay, that is uh, when 
the viruses are shed into the environment or into another host when we're talking about um, mother to offspring shedding and how do they actually exit the body right and of course host clearance would be um, how do some uh, viruses all right become dormant right or they could persist to cause a long-term shedding or chronic disease all right uh, host clearance would be discussed in more detail in the next uh, lecture right for now let's start with the routes of virus entry how do these viruses enter the body the skin would be the first barrier that the uh, variants would encounter this is the largest organ of the body and basically provides a tough and usually in an ideal setting an impermeable barrier to their entry okay and not just viruses a lot of microorganisms as well so what makes the skin an effective barrier number one there's presence of hair which is of course species variable but it is a mechanical barrier um, against microorganisms including variants and on the outer layer specifically the stratum corneum of the skin we have in in multiple areas of the body a dense layer of keratin it is keratinized which makes the skin a mechanical barrier as well uh, a low ph is recorded there are also presence of fatty acids and of course the presence of the epidermal dendritic cells now the immune system have this um bodyguards as they say na naka naka um designate through different parts of our body and for the skin the bodyguards would be these um tissue dendritic cells and we call them what we call them Langerhans cells, alright? So, sila yung unang babantay sa kung ano man yung makakapasok through that skin or through that layer of the skin, alright? So, how do viruses breach the skin, right? Can they go through the keratin? Can they go through um, these uh, layers of uh, squamous epithelium to enter the cells that they need to infect? short answer they cannot right but instead they take advantage of existing breaks in the skin integrity or um the vectors carrying them create those breaches all right so starting with breaks in the skin integrity as we have said it could be any aberration laceration cuts punctures um some viruses would um take advantage of superficial trauma wherein that's where they will proliferate then also we have deeper trauma which enables the spread of the variants systemically all right so what else another cause of breaking the skin integrity would be arthropod bites right bites made by mosquitoes ticks gnats um, midges and these are um, arthropods carry a lot of microorganisms or harbor a lot of microorganisms within them they are what we call vectors and in some literature they are also called flying needles right because they themselves can make that breach in the skin integrity which could be taken advantage uh, by viruses right so we know that the viruses carried or and or replicate within a vector are called arboviruses correct and examples of these arboviruses would be equine infectious anemia which is a retrovirus they're carried by horse flies uh horse flies uh sorry the retrovirus in horse flies survive for up to four hours um the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus is a khaleesi virus carried by flies fleas and uh, mosquitoes um, they usually survive in infected carcasses for months and other examples would be myxoma virus and the foul pox which is also um, called this uh, carried by other vectors 
and of course animal bites okay bites made by animals could be rats cats dogs right the most common virus that we talk about associated with animal bites would be rabies of course good job all right so what else how could we have breaks in our skin right that could also be caused by what we call an iatrogenic route right um the virus gains entry through the skin of the host um, through ways associated with medical intervention so these are things that could have helped uh, the animal the intention was good however it suffered complications because they are not done right okay um basic examples of these are uh, needle sticks right when we use um, a hypodermic needle from one animal and then use the same for another right um, that is a fast way of inoculating viruses into another patient so make sure that uh, disposable materials are disposed of after single use uh, what else we use the same syringe we uh, to call this we don't we do not care for drug vials we do not disinfect the top before we inject uh, the needle to aspirate for drugs all right blood transfusion very common when the blood or donor blood is not screened properly for uh i was lost in my thought sorry um so we when we disregard for example a septic technique when we conduct these medical procedures we could be um the actual vectors of these variants that enables them to infect a certain host all right so what's another route of virus entry respiratory tract right this is the most common portal of entry for uh, viruses all right the mucosal surface is lined with epithelial cells which can potentially support viral replication they love the respiratory tract that's why we have a lot of viruses which have uh, a cell and tissue tro tropism for within the respiratory tract so um before we discuss how the viruses um, infect the respiratory tract or invade this uh, system what are the defenses of the respiratory tract against viruses so what have you learned in um what do you call this in immuno the respiratory tract when we talk about the epithelium itself has what we call the mucociliary escalator you might have discussed this as a mucociliary blanket right so the lining of the respiratory tract upper or lower is lined with a layer of mucus which is produced by goblet cells which uh, serve as the epithelial blanket all right and this uh sorry this a layer of mucus is not alone you also have the presence of cilia which constantly moves the mucus out all right and when some microorganisms all right could enter into the respiratory tract they get trapped within this layer of mucus and um, they get moved out of the respiratory tract through the ciliary action of the cilia if you remember what's the lining what's the epithelial lining of the uh, the trachea you have the pseudostratified columnar right epithelium ciliated with goblet cells so that's it all right so there is also this inverse relationship between the size of particle and the distance it can penetrate through the respiratory tract for example particles which are 10 micrometers or more are easily trapped in the nasal mucosa right however particles 5 to 10 micrometers are carried to the trachea or bronchioles wherein they are trapped by the mucociliary escalator so the particles that are uh, inhaled directly into the alveoli they are so small all right 
they can um it doesn't mean that they ultimately has penetrated have penetrated the epithelium we also have the immune components which are which help in eliminating these uh, variants right we have the specialized immune aggregates spread throughout the respiratory tract we call those as NALT, BALT, and the tonsils. We also have macrophages um, in the alveoli waiting, again, as bodyguards to uh, destroy any particles which would try to infect the epithelium, right? So now we know the defenses. What do viruses do to overwhelm these uh, defenses, right? Number one, environmental factors are a big thing. Example, uh, exposure to ammonia, you know, uh, uh, for example, in uh, poultry farms where um, there is poor sanitation, the place is not cleaned regularly, there is buildup of ammonia, that actually causes ciliary stasis wherein the, cil uh, the cilia lining the epithelium is not moving as usual and that actually um, enables variants to enter the epithelium because they are not moved out and this is very common in poultry um, when you go into poultry med or when you discuss poultry production ang maraming sakit sa poultry ay respiratory you have Newcastle disease, Marix, uh, avian influenza, all that because their respiratory tract is um, very much sensitive to changes in the environment. That is why um, temperature is very much regulated in poultry farms. Um, they, uh, they can be immunosuppressed by changes in the environment. So these are very important factors. Number two, inflammation, which, is, which can be caused by sudden changes in the environment, dilutes the viscosity of the mucus layer. Remember, the mucus layer traps the variants and any other microorganisms which tries to invade the epithelium. And with inflammation, that dilutes the viscosity. Remember, it, with inflammation, it has this cascade of um, increased capillary permeability, um, increased um, blood flow into a certain part, and that actually contributes to this pathology. Number uh, uh, number two, lung capacity and surface area. The lung is such a big organ, and we have a pair of them, right? In humans, we have 140 square meters, which is a very highly absorptive area, and there is a high chance of inhaling a significant amount of variance and um, with a larger area for invasion. That is very good environment for infection to occur, right? And if it's local versus systemic spread, different respiratory viruses would have their own predilection. Again, tropism. You have the local ones, rhinovirus, adenovirus, which only replicates within the respiratory epithelium. They do not spread um, to other parts of the body. While there are also respiratory viruses which are systemic, which could replicate and cause infection um, by spreading to different parts of the body and infecting different kinds of cells. Example would be influenza, hog cholera, which is a classic swine fever, um, Newcastle disease, uh, canine distemper, and rinderpest, among others, among many others. Right, so from respiratory tract, let's go to the GI tract. Viruses can gain entry by simple ingestion of a food or a drink which is contaminated by the virus. Um, that is the most common cause of a spread of a canine parvovirus. Or you could have oral contact with virus contaminated inanimate objects. All right, so. That is why a lot of uh, babies are not, you know, allowed to just put any object in their mouth, something like that, right? And for example, um, in uh, canine parvovirus, whenever a litter of pups would share the same, um, we call this uh, food container, water container, it doesn't, the food 
or the water doesn't need to be contaminated by the virus. Even just the containers are enough when they uh, lick on those. Right. So what are the defenses the gastrointestinal tract ha uh, has for um, to avoid or to fight these viruses? Number one, the epithelial barrier of the upper digestive tract. Right. The oral cavity is a keratinized epithelium. So imagine um, the skin once again. That is a mechanical barrier which um, the viruses cannot uh, uh, penetrate. The esophagus is partially keratinized, but it is squamous in epithelium. And the material that passes, um, that passes the esophagus goes through it so fast that the variants does not have actual time to attach on that. Also, there is this rapid turnover of cells in these epithelia, which makes it not a very good site for viral attachment. Number two, digestive secretions. So there's a lot of secretions within the gastrointestinal tract, and each one would have their own physiological function. Number one, hydrochloric acid. We also have mucus, digestive enzymes, bile and pancreatic secretions. So these digestive enzymes uh, would have antimicrobial activity. The acidic uh, nature of the gastric mucosa would have um, would repel or would not be a very good environment for a lot of these viruses, all right? Number three, immune mechanisms. There are secretions of the gastrointestinal tract which contain IgA, right? These are secretory antibodies which are produced by the B lymphocytes of the gastrointestinal mucosa. And other mechanisms that are in there already waiting to be to fight off these microorganisms would be the defensins, the malts, the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues, right? So how do viruses, can, how do viruses fight that, right? Now, viruses can be acid and bile resistant. These are those enteric viruses which only infects or only has a tropism for, um, for the gastrointestinal tract. Examples would be parvo, rota, entero, and calici virus, right? The proteolytic enzymes produced by the GI tract can actually increase their infectivity when their capsid proteins are cleaved and makes it easier for these capsid proteins to attach to the um, membrane receptors of these cells. And as you can see in the image on the left, every virus would have its own predilection site um, of the villi that they would want. All right, Coronavirus would want the basal villus in the crypt, enteric adenovirus, uh, calici, and the rota and astro would go for the villus itself, and every part of it would have a different uh, role. All right? So this is how, um, what do you call this, uh, cell tropism happens. They're looking for that specific receptor, which are only found in certain parts of the villi. Now, there are also some viruses which are non-resistant to acid and bile, but find a way to bypass that environment or be protected whenever they pass through that acidic, proteolytic environment. So one example of that is the transmissible gastroenteritis virus, which affects pigs. This is a coronavirus, which is, um, this is susceptible to the acidity of the stomach. But when it is ingested, which is the usual carrier medium would be the milk suckled by the pigs, the milk act, acts as a buffer against the acid and the salts, right? Which is great. <laughs> this is really cool. I mean, how, how would the body know that the milk that is actually supposed to help them grow and develop actually carries that variant and protects that variant from the defenses mounted by the GI tract? Now, another, um, how about the immune defense? Can they actually uh, use the immune defenses by the body to actually help them? 
um, replicate? Yes, they can. You know the specialized M lymphoid cells? Uh, remember your histology? I don't even remember mine, so I don't blame you if you don't remember yours. But um, th there are specialized lymphoid cells, all right? Again, from the immune system. Immune system is very versatile. They are in the intestinal pears patches. I mean, yung, um, uh, they are this uh, basophilic staining uh, aggregates of cells in the villi. Okay? They carry the receptors, which are actually the viruses are looking for. Right? So they could actually attack and replicate within the lymphoid cells themselves, which is pretty cool. Again, <laughs> right, another way would be the genitourinary tract. This uh, enables venereal transmission of these viruses. Um, conjunctiva is also another um, route. However, the conjunctiva is, it was found to be less resistant than the skin because it is usually... Um, Sorry, but it is usually protected by uh, tears. Sorry, it is less resistant to the to viruses than the skin because it is open. You know, it is open to the world. Dirt could go in and such, but it is protected by tears. It is protected by your eyelids and the mechanical blinking that we all do. All right, so it tends to be washed. Um, more regularly okay however still some viruses would have a predilection site for this uh, they would still choose the conjunctiva um, enteroviruses and adenoviruses not that common but um, the significance of the conjunctiva as a route of virus entry would be that it is the commonly utilized route of entry by researchers to induce experimental viral infection for example, you are taking care of laboratory uh, animals, rats, mice, and you want to inoculate them with a virus. You don't have to inject the virus uh, for some. For some, you only need to um, um, inoculate the virus into their conjunctiva. All right. So once the variant has entered the host, and somehow overcome or overwhelmed the immune defenses of the animal, yeah, of that specific body system. How does it spread, all right? After the actual entry, we, we discussed the virus replication. So we're done with that. What happens after replication? Where do the new viruses go? So after replication, all right, after the virus has formed new viral particles, what, how, does these, uh, how do these new variants spread throughout the body? And why is it so important? There are two ways new variants can spread in the body. They can do it locally, wherein the challenge is um, they have to have the ability to infect a sufficient number of the epithelial cells to support a continuous high level of shedding, which assures transmission. All right, so that um, that virus should be able to infect a big number of epithelial cells. Right, the benefit though. Right, the benefit when they spread locally or dun lang sa specific epithelium na tinarget nila or kung saan sila unang nakapasok would be that the immune system would have limited chances to disrupt the viral infection process because they're staying in one area. All right? So the difference would be um, from the other one which is multisystemic spread or, or viremia wherein the variants could actually enter the systemic bloodstream and from there uh, go to any organ that they can in fact the challenge here would be the virus needs a high potential to infect multiple cell types all right they need to have a big or a large cell tropism they also need to balance the effect that they have on the cells because as you may know as we have discussed as well uh, these cells either die or they lice in response to 
excessive virion production, right? They die because um, the, vi the virus has used up the cell's resources or there's just a big number of variants inside that the plasma membrane becomes unstable and releases these variants. So they have to balance that effect and to maintain a certain number of viable cells that they are required to support and spread. If they, if they are going to kill all the cells that they are looking for, they will run out of cells. And when they run out of cells, they wouldn't be able to replicate even more. And they need to continually replicate to cause infection, right? And also, with viremia, with more chances of winning, <laughs> there are also more chances for the immune system to attack. Right? The benefit, though, is that um, if, if they can uh, infect more body sites, they would have a bigger surface area, which may participate in viral shedding, which makes them more efficient in causing infection. All right, so let's discuss first local spread. Local spread on uh, epithelial surfaces uh, would be a localized infection, usually happens in the skin, respiratory tract, intestinal mucosa, which occurs between adjoining or neighboring cells, and um, the viruses are shed directly into the environment. Right. As you can see in this image, all right, the infection of um, certain epithelium could lead um, for that um, epithelium or for that the cells that make up that epithelium would be um they could become keratinized they could mature they could change in function and for some that could actually cause um a change in the morphology of the cell which leads to cancer all right example would be papilloma viruses uh, corona and rotaviruses they localize in the intestinal tract and they do not replicate in the different tissues Influenza viruses only invade epithelial cells and they spare the sub-epithelial tissue though may enter the lymphatic system. Now, although these viruses can enter the lymphatics and would have the potential to spread, they, they would choose not to because the, uh, the viral receptors or other uh, cellular factors that they need for replication, that they need to enter the cell, are restricted to the epithelial cells. So they wouldn't bother to spread because they know that the receptors that they need are just in that area. And also, another important thing or point to make is that the restriction of the viral infection locally doesn't mean that they are milder or there is a lack of virulence or disease severity. Although localized, for example, the rotavirus, they, they are just localized in the intestinal tract, but injury to the intestinal mucosa can result in severe diarrhea. And that could be fatal for neonates like foals, calves, or puppies. Remember? And similarly, the influenza virus, for example, can cause extensive injury in the lungs, leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome and possibly death. So you shouldn't equate um, local um, viruses to be milder or, you know, they cannot spread um, and cause more severe infection. Because where they are, where they choose to be, they could be... Um, they could cause severe disease depending on the virus itself, right? Now, for those viruses which can invade the subepithelium and can lead to the spread through the lymphatics, how does it happen? All right. Now, how do they breach first the epithelium? Okay. Remember when we discussed the replication that they could bud out from the apical surface and the basal surface? These virus, uh, viruses would breach the basal uh, membrane of the epithelial cells. And right there in the sub-epithelium, there could be um, two ways that they could spread. Number one, they can be phagocytosed by the immune cells. Remember, we have um, these phagocytic leukocytes like dendritic cells, macrophages, which are waiting in the sub-epithelium 
uh, for these microorganisms and they could be phagocytosed by these cells. Also, they can migrate into the afferent lymphatic vessels and through these uh, two mechanisms, they could now be carried to the regional lymph nodes through the afferent lymphatic ves uh, vessels, right? So um, when they are in the, we call this the lymph nodes, sorry, all right? There's a lot of things that could happen. Number one, the variants, the free variants, the non-cell associated variants can be inactivated. Right? And with this inactivation, the variants could be destroyed. Um, a part of their capsid or envelope glycoprotein can be presented to the antigenic cells, all right? to those T-presenting uh, lymphocytes and such, to, uh, for uh, immune response, for the development or for the production of antibodies. All right? That's number one. Number two, they can uh, replicate inside these immune cells. So they can, again, hijack these immune cells um, to create more variants. And number three, they can enter the bloodstream through the efferent lymphatic vessels wherein they will drain into the vena cava and into the main circulation. And when they enter the bloodstream, they can be uh, variants or a, a complete a viral particle, or they can be variants inside these um, immune, uh, immune cells, like the dendritic cells and macrophages, right? So where do they go after the vena cava? What will they target? They will target the um, those organs which uh, would have a very good chance for them to actually uh, spread more. That will be the liver, the spleen, and the kidney, which actually uh, filters blood, right? But before that, before that, right? We have to talk about the role of inflammation in this, right? Inflammation is, a, is an immune response that is normal with the body. That is how we fight off microorganisms. That is how we maintain homeostasis and such. However, um, viruses that uh, replicate locally actually utilize this uh, immune uh, mechanism to spread even more, right? As we know, local viral invasions, all right, attracts, uh, causes inflammation, right? The more efficient the viral invasion is, like the more if epithelial cells it is uh, infecting, the more, um, what they call this, the more variants it is releasing in the, in the environment, which actually gets detected by these bodyguard cells, um, sends a signal and causes inflammation. Okay, The more severe inflammation, the more severe the tissue damage is. And some viruses take advantage of this inflammatory response to infect more cells. Number one, there is increased blood flow. So, mas maraming... Uh, immune cells ang pupunta sa kanila and these immune cells again they can target and they could replicate inside them number two there is increased endothelial permeability they could go into the cells uh, sorry into the blood vessels as the uh, as the blood cells are leaking out right diapedesis of the blood cells from vessels to tissues as i've discussed and leukocyte trafficking and activation okay they don't know that um uh, these immune cells think they're going to war only f to be um, eaten alive by these viruses, especially if the extent of the uh, replication has already been uh, very good in, in that area. Tipong ma-overwhelm na sila nung number ng free variants, right? And this is crucial for the pathogenesis of arboviruses. Remember, arthropod-born viruses, right? The arthropod bite would be the site of virus inoculation would cause inflammation. So saktong sakto dun sa area kung saan sila deposit, they could take advantage of that existing inflammation already. Right? They do not even have to, to replicate so much. They don't even have to make so much effort to replicate and kill the cells to mount an inflammatory response. Just the arthropod bite alone initiates that cause for inflammation, which they can take advantage of. 
right? That's how smart these uh, viruses are, right? So that is local spread. Let's now go into systemic spread or what we call viremia, right? Blood, as we know, is the most effective vehicle for rapid virus spread throughout the body, right? And there are two uh, types of viremia. Number one would be primary viremia. This is uh, the initial entry of the virus to the blood after infection, meaning it could be um, the entry of the variants from the lymph node that they are currently infecting into the vena cava. And as you may expect, primary viremia would be clinically inapparent. Wala tong kinukos na clinical signs, right? Because as of now, the only things, uh, the only places that the virus have uh, invaded would be the epithelium and the lymph node, the region lymph node at that, okay? But after a primary viremia, what happens here, right? Once the virus is carried by the blood, the blood goes everywhere. But most importantly, there are major target organs wherein the virus would want to go to. Okay, the bone marrow, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, and other lymph nodes, wherein they could um, undergo seeding. All right, they will go into there, into these organs, and they would produce more and more variants. And that uh, consistent production of variants would cause a consistent amount of variants in the blood. So, tuloy tuloy lang siya. And that um phenomenon wherein yung bagong variants na produce from these organs now enter the bloodstream now that is what you call secondary viremia and that leads to the development of clinical signs right because now the cells that are being killed the cells that are being taken advantage of um or being bypassed yung cellular function nila would be those cells which have which have specialized functions that we can see um, in, physically sa pasyente kapag may mali dun sa mga organs na yun, right? And that is, uh, that's what will call, uh, cause the clinical signs, right? So, uh, related to that, related to that, um, various interactions with vascular endothelial cells uh, as far as we have discussed, ang sinasabi ko pa lang naman ay um, the viruses um, ride these ride through these uh, blood vessels to go into the target organs. Okay? Kaya merong organ tropism, cell tropism, and such. But what if, right? What if <laughs> um, these viruses are so smart as well that they can invade uh, or they can um, enter the endothelial cells which make up the blood vessels. Right? Again, remember your histology. Okay, The vascular endothelium uh, constitutes the blood tissue interface. There's a lot of uh, places wherein we find these endothelial cells. Number one would be the lungs, which is the blood tissue interface between the alveolar blood and the tissue blood, right? wherein there's gas exchange. Another important barrier wherein we see this would be the blood-brain barrier, right? This is highly selective. This is created that way wherein you have endothelial cells in tight junctions, uh, connected by tight junctions, to prevent uh, any bad thing, including drugs, uh, any molecule that is bad, from entering the brain tissue, right? However, variants are so smart that there are some mechanisms in play that they can penetrate this barrier as well don't pay too much attention in the picture i just put it there right so uh number one they can move passively between or through the endothelial cells all right some variants would be very small that it could passively move through these endothelial cells. And remember, when there is inflammation, the gaps between these endothelial cells are widening that they could um, take advantage of that. Number two, 
viruses can infect endothelial cells on the apical membrane, then sa taas, and they can bud out of the basal membrane, which is in contact with the brain tissue. This is um, the mechanism of Ebola virus and yellow fever virus, right? And number three would be what they usually do in the tissues. They will hijack the leukocytes that are traveling through the barrier to get into the cerebrospinal fluid, right? They will infect those leukocytes and ride through them like a Trojan horse, right? If you don't know, if you don't know the, the reference with the Trojan horse, I suggest you watch and read a lot of things, okay? <laughs> right? There's, I cannot explain the Trojan horse um, uh, story anymore. Watch Troy, um, Google um, uh, Helen of Troy, Paris, uh, I think it was, and Greek mythology. Google that, all right? <laughs> So they can um, infect these leukocytes and get into the brain matter, right? So when we say endothelial infection, um, it may be clinically inapparent because they're just lining the blood vessels, right? Um, however, um, infection of endothelial cells can be characterized by vascular injury, which can result to... Uh, hemorrhage and edema especially in the brain which is the pathogenesis of those viral fevers right um ebola yellow fever and such and this could cause disseminated intravascular coagulation however it is uh, unlikely that um the inflammatory mediators that are produced by the macrophages and dendritic cells uh, also contribute to the pathogenesis. So it's mainly the first uh, mechanism. All right. So this is one way for them to get to, to get into the brain. <laughs> Another way is that variants can all viruses can also spread via the nerves. All right. And when I say nerves, this would be the peripheral nerves. Right? Members of the peripheral nervous system, and they can gain access to the CNS through them. Right? So viruses which are inoculated in peripheral tissues like muscles can enter the nerve endings that are supplying that uh, or innervating that muscle. And the variants travel through the axon cytoplasm of the nerve. Right? And in the transport, uh, transport process, sorry, some viruses can uh, infect the Schwann cells. Remember what Schwann cells are? They produce the myelin sheath for the peripheral nervous system, right? So um, herpes viruses can actually infect these uh, Schwann cells. Um, and remember, after the PNS, after the peripheral nervous system, we go back to your anatomy and histology. Um, the From the peripheral nerves, it goes into the ganglion, and then ganglion would have the uh, preganglionic nerve going up into the... Um, uh, spinal cord right now these viruses can also cross the synaptic junctions which is um, particular for rabies and pseudo rabies viruses the viruses can also travel um, from the nervous system back to the peripheral tissues for further infection and viral shedding okay herpes viruses would go back into the skin and mucous membranes rabies would infect uh, from the nervous system, would infect the salivary gland, which is very important for shedding of the viruses. So I keep on saying shedding, shedding. What do I mean by shedding? Shedding is uh, when the host um, excretes or secretes um, the, vir the new variants that it has produced to uh, so that the virus could can continually infect other hosts, all right? And the portals or the doors that the viruses would use to exit the infected host would mimic the same portals that they entered with, all right? So for example, uh, this dog, all right? It got infected um, by uh, with an enteric virus through a contamination of their food, all right? 
that virus will also shed through the gastrointestinal system and the variants can be found in the feces of the animal. It can also shed through the urine, right? On the cranial aspect, it could shed through the saliva, sputum, respiratory droplets, right? They can also be found in the ocular and nasal discharges, right? And like papi uh, papillomaviruses, herpes viruses, polyomaviruses, they can also shed through the skin and many other um, ways, all right? This continuous shedding of variants is crucial para maintain yung level of infection in a population. And of course, there is also a question of if the amount of virus shed in excretions and, secre and secretions are important. Like for example, rotavirus, you only need one virus to be infected. That's how good that variant is, rotavirus. Okay, so you would expect that when it is shed, right, it doesn't matter how much poop the, the animal is producing. Because as long as that poop is uh, concentrated with viruses, you're good to go. All right? So it all depends. It all, it all depends on the virus itself. So what are the other specific sources of virus shedding? You right? um, have the skin. These are just examples of the viruses which use uh, these um, portals of exit. Right? Um, a specific ones for uh, milk. All right? These can be uh, um, transmitted from the mom to the kid, right? Kae would be caprine, arthritis, encephal encephalopathy, I think, or encephalitis. Caprine, uh, yeah, what's caprine? I think it's goat. <laughs> yeah, uh, kae virus um, from blood, yeah, genital secretions, all right, and for organs. Now, sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> There are viruses which go into cells but do not shed, right? They infect, they replicate within that area, but they don't have an opportunity to shed, right? These are what we call dead ends, right? Dead ends are the sites of replication which does not result to shedding or uh, what do you call um, them um, killing the cell, and li uh, lysing it so that they will be released. It doesn't result that way. Infection may happen, yes, right? But no shedding happens, right? This is, uh, for example, African swine fever, which is very much an important topic uh, at this time, especially we are still facing an uh, ASF epidemic, okay? And hog cholera, which is classical swine fever, right? These uh, viruses would go into the nervous tissue and muscles and replicate there. So the variants are in there, right? But they wouldn't shed, right? They, they don't have the opportunity to shed. And they wouldn't. <laughs> the viruses wouldn't. So what will they do instead? Um, in a way, it is for it to be transmitted, is that um, when these infected nervous tissue and infected muscles are fed, to carnivores and omnivores that causes the transmission of the disease all right so basically dead ends hindi siya hindi nila nasusuka hindi nila na ta transmit actively to another host but um these sites of replication can be a way for it to be transmitted right another example would be um, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is mad, ma, mad cow disease caused by prions. They also infect nervous tissue and when um, when uh, the meat and bone meal of cows, cattle, are made, sometimes it includes uh, bovine offal, which includes the nervous tissue, which causes the disease. Right? Another example would be um, in some aspect, um, retroviruses and bovine diarrhea, uh, bovine diarrhea virus, wherein they do not shed as much, but they can be transmitted vertically, um, transplacentally, meaning the viruses can cross the barrier between the mom and the fetus and could infect that, um, that offspring. So basically, they are not shedding, 
right? They're not shedding out, but they can transfer those viruses in, right? So it is an unintentional transmission on the perspective of the virus, but it is successful for uh, with this mechanism for these diseases to be effectively transmitted. All right, that is it for viral infection and spread. I hope we were able to be enlightened by how viruses spread throughout the body and what are the significance of the different mechanisms. In our next lecture, we will be discussing how viruses um, affect the cell and what are the um, cytopathic, microscopic um, indications of viral replications within a cell. All right. Thank you and have a good day.